Thank you, Jesus. Wonderful blesser. Great friend. Watcher over us, sir. <laughs> Thanks for being in our life, Jesus. We mean it. Help us, Lord, now as we listen to your word, that our hearts receive, our ears hear, and our eyes see, and our hearts understand, so the birds of the air don't pluck away that which you plant. Help us with our roots. Help us find water. Help us be strong. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's message is entitled, Beneath My Feet. Woo! I say, Beneath My Feet. Yeah. This is a preachy sort of message, I think, as compared to my other not preachy sort of messages. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is more a sermon of, of take a point, pin it on your forehead, take a point, pin it on your forehead, and you walk away with your entire corkboard full of points to hang on to, to feel, to experience, to think about. We know these verses, many, many of them, but do we know these verses? Do we? It's one thing to say, yes, I've studied the manual for driving the car. I know what the steering wheel is. I know what the gear shift is. I think I understand the principles of combustion. And I think I know where the brake is. And then you get in the car with the instructor, and he says, okay, put the car in gear, and you go, what's a gear? <laughs> After a little while, you go, I know where the gear is, and you also know what the word grind means. <laughs> and after a while, you know what the word grind doesn't mean anymore, and you feel really good about that. Then you hit a hill, and you're not quite sure what roll back really means. And eventually, you start gaining some confidence and some speed, and you know you're a driver. Well, I hate to say this, but a lot of these verses that we look at a lot of times that tell us so much in so few words are very much like learning to drive. We go, uh-huh, I understand it, way cool, far out, right on, groovy, word. Uh, what did it mean? <laughs> and in that we prove ourselves to be exactly like the disciples of old who sat with the Master for three and a half years in face-to-face -face conferences, got to see the power, Got to know to show, got to see the demons flow and go and run and squeak and squawk and run and jump and got to see all them Pharisees and Sadducees and all those other people getting all fritzicated. And then they go, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, they were studying the manual, but they hadn't quite adapted yet. I think that the verses I'm going to be bringing up today, we quote them sometimes so much that we don't even really hear them anymore. But we have to stop and think. We have to repeat them to ourselves. The title of this <laughs> message is called Beneath My Feet, because I'm hoping that by the time this message is over, you'll have a little bit more of a heavenly perspective. You'll realize you're not as low as you think you are, just by what God's Word tells us about us. A little about us, a little about Christ, a little about attitude, and then the sermon's over. So first, let me tell you a few things about you, or me. Beneath my feet is the title of the message. The very first thing that happened when this title came into my mind last night is I was walking around going, Beneath my feet, <clears throat> what does that mean? <clears throat> is it a sermon about conquering the devil? Is it a sermon about, about, well, what is it a sermon about? <laughs> Beneath my feet. You know, do we want to have a sermon about the wonderfulness of conquering, or what? And the more I worked on it, you know, a little bit of this, a verse here or two, you know how it goes. You know, a verse falls in here, the conclusion gets written first, the middle gets written last, the, you know. And after a while, I start looking at the pattern of this, and I'm going, hmm. I think the point of this message is, do you know who you are? Do you know who I am? And do you know where you're living? <laughs> I think the point of this message is, get up. <laughs> I think the point of this message is, change your mindset. 
change your mindset. Get a hold of these truths so that it does us all good. So let me tell you a few things about you. This is the intro part, but really it's the sermon too. It's going to just kind of flow right out into the message. Let me tell you something about you that you have got to get a hold of. Really strongly get a hold of. Ephesians 2.6 And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I wrote down to myself when I was writing the outline, seated in heavenly places. Then I went to my handy-dandy Bible Search Me program and I typed in, seated, heavenly, found nothing. Seated places, found nothing. Seat, place, nothing. I'm thinking to myself, hmm, do I have my doctrine wrong? Of course not. I know I don't have my doctrine wrong. Been around too many years. So what did I miss? So I went snooping and I realized, oh, made us to sit together in heavenly places. Mm-hmm. Heavenly places, heaven leaves, heaven up. Heaven up. Message is about beneath my feet, but it's really about first up. Do you ever stop to think about the importance of what it means to be seated in heavenly places. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to me? Heavenly places, heavenly seat, heavenlies, call it what you will. It isn't earth. It's not earthly minded. It's not carnally minded. It's not naturally minded. You know? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heavenly places places. <laughs> heavenly places is a whole different place than earthly places. Duh. Yeah, duh. <laughs> it is. Why do we keep insisting on feeling and thinking like we're walking in earthly places? Why do we keep living our mental existence worrying as much as we do about earthly places? <laughs> Why is it that every time we have discussions about things, not we, I mean we, all of us, you know, all of us, the first five things out of our mouth are earthly places. And how hard is it for us to crank it up? Up to heavenly places. We find ourselves struggling because we don't even see ourselves there. We see ourselves here. Our mindset is, get up in the morning and I'm seated in earthly places. Sometimes our mindset is, get up in the morning and see myself in hell. Sometimes uh, we get up in the morning and we see ourselves in dry places. Who lives in dry places? <clears throat> Not supposed to be you. <laughs> Hint. <laughs> Them that go thither, thither, thither. You know. <laughs> Them that speaketh with forketh tongueth goeth to dry places. <laughs> and they don't like it there, so why would we want to go visit them? <laughs> why do we wake up in the morning and the first thing out of our mouth is, oh. Because we're not thinking in heavenly places. We didn't wake up in the morning with the Spirit of God on our face, in our hearts, roaming through our brain. You know, we woke up like a bunch of creaky doors. <sighs> Guess I gotta go walk to and fro in the earth. <laughs> You're not supposed to be doing that either. <laughs> Heavenly places starts right here. Right between the old ears. Heavenly places right here. You ever seen one of them them, um, then there are those, you know, um, math planes pictures where you have a parallel plane and you have a perpendicular plane and you put the two planes together and it forms a line where the two planes intersect, you know, it looks like this, like a T that goes through itself. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Okay. 
So my two hands locked into each other like this. Got a parallel plane and got a perpendicular plane under the line there in the middle. Well, I'm here to tell you your brain, your spirit, your mind, the you, is right there at the intersection in those two planes 24-7. There's the earthly plane, and then there's the heavenly plane. Right and they intersect mm -hmm. right through you. Hallelujah. And it's your choice which plane you want to play on. Right on. Because it's already intersected in you. Mm -hmm. It became intersected in you the day that you decided to do the really bold, brave, and brilliant thing of saying, Yo, Jesus, mind <laughs> if I come in? <laughs> Right after he said, yo, dude, mind if I enter? <laughs> and the two of you had yourself a spiritual din-din. And the planes linked. And you're not going to ever unlink. You're never going to be happy. You're never going to be happy living on the natural plane anymore. People who live on the natural plane who have never yet stepped into the spiritual plane, into the heavenlies, haven't even tasted lightly of the worlds to come, they have no clue. They don't know. They think partying is a heavenly plane. Actually, it's a quick elevator up and a drop of 42,000 feet. <laughs> they all know it in the morning. It's not up at all. But once you stepped into Christ, you went into heavenly places. You went into heavenly places. You became seated. You became placed. You got put. It changed. It's over. Quit. For, just, just forget the world. Okay? You know how I mean that? Just forget the world. What's its importance to you? You're an eternal being. You're headed for eternity. Heavenly places is your home. Up there. You know what I mean? You decided to make an investment in a land far, far, far away. And that investment's growing. Wait till you cash in. <laughs> you could go the entire rest of your life, be flat, broke, walk the earth like a vagabond, poor, and God's word says, but you are rich. Because you stepped into the bank of heaven. <clears throat> I think we need to realize before we ever open our mouth to pray for somebody, ever open our mouth to pray for ourselves, ever open our mouth, that the intersection is right through us. Guess what that means? You've tapped the golden vein. You too are nuclear now. <laughs> that which was invisible can now become visible through you. Heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Didn't say you did it in your own works. Didn't say it because you're humanity. Didn't say it because we are going to have a harmonic convergence of mankind where we're all possibly peaceful in one. And once we get there, we'll have the power of bleh, whatever. In Christ Jesus, you were made to sit with me up there. Thank you very much. It's an us thing. You know, that's why we do the prayer of our Father who art in heaven. It's not your Father who, do, who art in heaven. You know? Uh, after the name of him whom Paul preaches, uh, we cast you out. A little impersonal there. <laughs> Try the personal approach. Get hooked, get wired, now shoot. <laughs> I guarantee you, when your gun's loaded from up there, the bullets work. <laughs> you try to pack it yourself, it's going to go boom in your barrel. Ephesians 1.3 says this about you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So first we put you there and then we give you the keys to the kingdom. How about them apples? First we put you into the heavenlies and where's all the spiritual blessings hiding? In the heavenlies. How can you bring spiritual blessings to earth unless you're willing to acknowledge your existence in the heavenlies? Oh, I don't know, I'm probably, you know, my sin is probably in the way, and I don't think God's going to answer me because, I, you know, I'm just really feeling kind of yucky today, but okay, I'll pray for you. Sure, brother, not a problem. What's that sickness again? <laughs> I'll work up some faith here. I'll get some faith going here. Just a moment. Let me, let me get my faith going here. Okay, um, oh, we never say that out loud. Come on. 
We do the we do the perfectly good Christian mask thing. We put over our mask. Uh, sure, brother. Absolutely no problem whatsoever. Let us trust God together. And way down inside, the little kids go, Oh, God, I hope this works. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now, if you be seated in heavenly places, for real, if you be, from God's point of view, planted on another plane, then shouldn't it be a matter of just reaching over here and grabbing what you need and bringing it across? shouldn't it be that you walk up to somebody lay hands on them and the first thing you say to yourself is since I am a son of God and since the Father is with me and Lord I know that uh, you don't need me to pray this out loud for our sake but uh, for your sake their sake whatever I'm going to go ahead and pray this out loud in Jesus name be whole how you doing brother better nope not yet Okay, let me try that again. Pull that bow one more time. Somebody's arguing with me. <laughs> Got to reach over here to my quiver. Next arrow. Didn't work on that one, huh? Try it again. <laughs> See, in heavenly places, you know who you are. You know what you are. You know why you are. You know who God is. You know who Christ is. You know who the angels are. You know what the devil is and isn't. You know. Because you're in heavenly places. But when you're down here on this mud ball, mucky muck, dry place... You don't know nothing. I'm sorry, I should say that more grammatically correct. You don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Ah, you don't know nothing. <laughs> you get into the Spirit, you know everything. Mm -hmm. For the moment that you're there, for the minute that you're there, for the hour that you're there, for the, for the whatever that you're there, whatever it is, two minutes, five minutes, twenty minutes, an hour and a half, a day and a half, two and a half, three and a half, revival time, I don't care. 2.5 weeks as God goes through a church and everybody's a buzz for 2.5 weeks. Why? Because the great plane of heaven decided to intersect smack right through the middle of a congregation and people went, Whoa! Whoa! Did you see that? Whoa! Why? Because one man walked into the room who understood that he's the intersection between heaven and earth. Because one guy, you know, slightly large, roly-boly, laughy attitude walks up, tells a few testimonies of a few healings and a few deliverances and a few raisings of the dead, and somehow that all of a sudden creates a revival? <laughs> or is it because the man of God walks into the room who knows who he is, what he is, where he is, how he lives, knows the one for whom he works, and God says, okay, portal open, and we all drink of the great fountain <clears throat> because somebody had the understanding that he actually was, is, <coughs> and always shall be seated in heavenly places? That's not glorifying yourself, that's not stroking your ego, and that's not taking any credit for anything you did. It is, I be one with the Father, the Father be one with me. Now what do you do? Moving on. So we'll just leave that spiritual blessing statement right there and you go figure out what spiritual blessings are yours when you get there. <sighs> Number two, something about you and me. I'm going to read Hebrews 11, Hebrews 4, 11 through 16. Hebrews 4, 11 through 16. Let us therefore labor to enter into that rest. <clears throat> Hint. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Hint. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Oops. There's a consequence for not laboring to enter into the rest. You end up in unbelief. Hint. Are you in unbelief? <laughs> Check it out. Where are you living? Four. The word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. <clears throat> Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
So the second thing I'm telling you about you is this. Working backwards up the verses, like rewinding old tape, you know. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Well, how are you going to get there? Simple. You're already in heavenly places. Go for a walk. <laughs> Take a mental stroll over to where God's throne is. Have a nice conversation with the one who loves you, who works for you, who lives with you. Shouldn't be that rough if you're there, right? It's a little hard for me to talk to the President of the United States right now because I'm not in the White House. But if I'm in the White House, I just go down the hall. Yep. There's a revelation here. If I'm already in heavenly places, where's the throne? Right down the street. Right around the corner. Right behind me. Two feet away. 20 feet away. I don't know. How do you travel in the spirit? Oh, from here to there. <coughs> how long does it take to get there? Oh, from now to then. You getting my point? Picture, feel, sense, talk to yourself, realize where you are. Come boldly to the throne. The high priest has already gone into the heavenly. He's already opened up the veil between us and him. He's rent aside the barrier between God and man. There is no barrier and you're seated in heavenly places. If we're seated in heavenly places, then we should labor to enter into that rest, don't you think? We should work it up. We should pump it up, you know, like the well. We should work it up. How do you work it up? I'll answer that for you. You have two ways to work it up. Praise and worship. Thank you, Lord, that I'm in heavenly places. Thank you, Lord, for raising me up. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. And you just keep doing it until all of a sudden the universe shifts. Amen. Anybody ever experienced the universe shift? <laughs> ever feel like the walls turn all of a sudden strangely transparent? Ever feel like all of a sudden size and space change? Ever disappear for five minutes of worship and come back and discover it was an hour you were gone? <laughs> I promise you, up there time doesn't flow like it does down here. We struggle with our unbelief. Let me tell you how to beat that unbelief with point number two of that same statement I just said. Declare it. Confess it. Speak it. You can thank God for it, which is a way of declaring it, or you can just declare it. I am seated in heavenly places with Christ. The little voice pops up and says, Do you know what you did yesterday? I am seated in heavenly places with Christ. Right, you're a worm and no person. I am seated in heavenly places with Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who do you think you are? I know who I am. I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ. And where are you talking to me from? I didn't take any long-distance calls. Get thee down. You could stop and say, what we're going to learn in a few more verses, but I'll just do a preempt. I am a son, I am a daughter of Christ, of God. I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. Who are you? I am. Who are you? I am. Can you imagine the conversation? You stand up to God and go, I am. He says, I am. <laughs> what do we need to do? I don't know. Let us make man in our likeness and image. What do you think? I am. Keep going. <laughs> See, what the world tries to steal from God by usurping him, we can be like God, we can be equal to God, we are gods ourselves. They can't even come close to. Because they're not seated in heavenly places. They are on earthly places trying to throw up a grappling hook with a bunch of knots on the rope and hoping they can climb up far enough to get there. Anybody who comes up by any other way is a thief. Amen. There's only one door. We know where it is. There's only one access to heavenly places. We know who it is. And nobody's going to get there without him. But once you've got him, go on in. Come on out. We need to get our hearts solid on this point. Number three. Colossians 2, 10 to 14. Let me tell you something else about you. You are complete 
in him. Uh, Colossians 2, 10 to 14. You are complete in him. I'm incomplete. I'm not finished yet. Yes. You are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Please tell me where that places him in relationship to powers and principalities. King of king. On top. Yeah, king. Up. High. Really high. Super high. <laughs> principalities and powers like low, down. Under yeah. his feet. Title of message is, where? Beneath my feet. Right on. Okay, so... In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. To put it another way, Christ cut off your world for you. Buried with him in baptism, that matters sunk, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of life, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. How many of your sins is God still holding against you, please? Zero. Zero. Thank you. And tomorrow morning, after you sin today, how many is going to hold against you? Same number. Same number, because you're going to do the same thing tomorrow you did today. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be in heavenly places again. <laughs> you're catching on. How can that abide in heavenly places? It can't. Next statement. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary us, took it away, nailing it to his cross. Nailing it to his cross. Now, the key word I want you to grab a hold of here is the word risen. Risen. That means the world is walking on this level and we took an elevator to the penthouse. We are risen. We who were dead in our sins hanging out with the rest of the children of disobedience mm -hmm. decided to accept the offer from the porter. You know what the porter is? Mm -hmm. He's the guy that stands in the elevator and says, going up? Mm -hmm. And we said, hmm, Never been up before. Tried down. That was really bad. <laughs> Basement living is really bad. You know, playing with the porcelain god is really bad. I think I'll try up for a while. And we chose to go towards God. And we chose to accept Christ. And we chose to get in the elevator. And guess what? We rose. It worked. We rose. So... You are risen people. Now, think about that for a moment. That means there's a bunch of dead people walking around. Do you want to know why you can't seem to equate to the world anymore and they can't seem to equate to you anymore and the more the higher you go, the worse they have a time with it? It's because they can't get up the elevator. And they just feel like you're getting further and further away from them, really, like, far, you know? Right. And you're looking at them going, strangely dim, little people down there. Ooh. Ooh, whoa, this altitude, I almost can't tell what your face looks like. You were growling at me two minutes ago. Yay! <laughs> and as for those creatures in the basement, well. oh, well, there's a furnace down there for them. <laughs> you are risen. See yourself risen. Quit seeing yourself fallen. The devil has played a great game with religion. He's gotten us to focus on you are worms. You are worm bait. You are sinners. You are forever fallen. You will never overcome. Elevator going up, please. Bing! <laughs> Hit that button and rise. Hit that button and rise. When you start to rise into the heavenly places, you start to realize sins just go clink. There's a law of gravity. Sorry, you start climbing up, certain things have to fall off. Okay. You're a rocket and stage one just launched. You're a rocket and stage two just jumped off. Now you're just a little cone flying through the sky. Mm. You don't need all that extra baggage anyways. Only get you off the ground. Mm. It's only get you off the ground. You're off the ground. Kick it. You're off the ground. Might as well pretend you're a satellite and send some transmissions out. <laughs> you're closer to God than you were yesterday. Mm -hmm. And you're closer to heaven than you were yesterday. Mm. And you're closer to the end of things. That <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Every day you get closer. I fear for people in the world. Every day they get further away. Yep. They do. 
Every day that a man is against Christ, he's further from him. That's why we've got to go save souls. Not willing that any should perish. Let me tell you something else about you. Number four. And I wrote this all under the category of intro, so, I mean, you know. Number four. 2 Corinthians 5.17 and following. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new, new creature. creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Christ Jesus, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you for, by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, catch that old English word, in his place, we're taking care of business, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What's it say in the scriptures? It says, seek ye the first. kingdom and the righteousness of him. Seek ye first, right? Yeah. So when you sought Christ, you fulfilled the verse. Guess what? That means the second of the part of the verse is now yours. And all these things should be added unto you. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Because you reached the first condition. And while we still argue that in a self-works righteous sort of way of, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, well, I didn't today, so therefore I'm not entitled to. Thinking, Shouldn't be eating this right now. I say, you already have. Stage one is done. Mm -hmm. You're in God's mind. Now, i got to say something here that I think I've, God's given me something that really sink my teeth into this. I've said it before, but it's really strong. You have to understand that everything promised, everything written, everything stated is from God's mind. Mm -hmm. It's from His point of of view. You have to come into agreement with him. He says you're in heavenly places. He is counting you in heavenly places no matter how many times you fail, fall, or crawl on earthly places. Righteous man getteth up, getteth up, getteth up, up, gets up, get up, get up. Wake up, church, get up. <laughs> You have to count the fact that God has put you there. If you disagree with God, you cannot get the blessings of God. He might give you some of them just out of his mercy, grace, and goodness. But the rest of it is accessible by you agreeing with him. We call that faith. You have to see that God sees you in that place. You have to see. You say, well, I'm not there yet. I'm down here on earth walking around in the mudville. No, uh, you're not. No. no, you're not. Because in God's mind, you're not counted there anymore. Mm, that's right. He moved you from the shelf that said used goods, yeah. damaged goods, repackaged you, and put you over here on the new shelf. You're a new, right new creature. New. Mm. You're not just refurbished. You're new. Okay. You're new. <laughs> He took out that, that rubber spine that you had and replaced it with a real one that works and has a nervous system in it. Cool. That's why you feel the pain you do. <clears throat> he changed your eyeballs so that they don't just look at the natural anymore. You open your eyes and go, what was that? You look in somebody's eyes and it was, what was that? You listen to a radio broadcast and you go, what was that? Yeah. And something inside you goes, what was that? Yeah. Because the new creature is going, huh, what, huh? I can see that. A few years ago, you couldn't. Matter of fact, a few years ago, if a Christian walked up to you and told you some of the things that you now believe, said, I'm a prophet of God, and I hereby tell you that here's the following ten things you're going to believe, you'd laugh them to scorn. Because <laughs> you didn't have the eyes, the ears, the heart, the mind, the spirit. But once you flip to the other side, isn't it a lot easier now? Now you not only see what they do, you see what we do. Yeah. 
You're a new creature. Galatians 6.15 adds, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision avails anything nor circ uncircumcision, but a new creature. You're a new creation. You're new. You are improved. <laughs> I want you to see who you are, where you are, what you are. That's what God's saying. I think that's part of this message. And once you see all that, the rest of it is beneath your feet. Number five. Start with 2 Corinthians 6.18. And will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Cool. Acts 2.18. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Mm. So start with those for a second. You're a son, you're a daughter, you're a servant, you're a handmaiden, and what does that mean? That means you are entitled. That means God says, here's who I deal with. I deal with sons, daughters, servants, and handmaidens. Who doesn't God deal with? Uh, children of disobedience, uh, those who are in witchcraft, opposing him, those who are rebellious, those who are you know, uh, um, of the Adamic nature instead of of the Christos nature, not quickened together with Christ, he's not going to favor them. He will work to redeem, but they cannot say, we are sons. <clears throat> you know that people in the world keep trying to say they're, they're sons of God? You know that even Christians some, sometimes say, well, God created Adam, and Adam was a son of God, and you're a descendant of Adam, and that therefore makes you a son of God. And what the problem is with that statement? It gets used in contrast to this one. Mm -hmm. I'm your father and I've made you my son. Now you've got to think to yourself for a second. Is that a contradiction of Bible terms? <laughs> or are we talking two kinds of sons here? Mm -hmm. A heavenly son who's been quickened versus an earthly son who's wandering the earth. You know what? There's two ways to say son. One is by birth, father, and one is by heart response. If a man and a woman have a child, and that child always stealing from them, tearing their property apart, cursing them to their face, slamming the door and ignoring them, cranking the music at 3 o'clock in the morning so loud the parents can't sleep, are not the parents tempted to say, not my son? even though he is their son? When we stand against God, even though we were created by him, and by that we are begottens, we're sons, born, but that doesn't necessarily make you son placed. It doesn't make you son put. It doesn't even make you son functional. <laughs> Did you know that the prodigal was still a son while he was a prodigal, but he was considered a dead son? But when he came home, he said, what? I got my son back. Well, you always had your son. He was just kind of like lost out there, you know? It was always a son, wasn't he? Yeah, but there's a being a son, and then there's being a son. When you accept your place, O son, O daughter, O servant, O handmaiden, of being in the heavenly places, of being a new creature, of being in Christ, you will be dealt with as a son, as a daughter, as a servant, as a handmaiden. And one of the things he says he will do is he says, I will prophesy on them. I will pour my spirit all over you. You're going to be sitting in a room and here I come. Ooh. <laughs> How does an invisible God prove that he's trying to communicate to you? Oh, he has ways. He has ways. <laughs> Romans 8.15 must be important, I put it in twice. <laughs> For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba. We have received the spirit, and the spirit inside says, Dad, Dad, Dad. Ephesians 1.5, Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself 
according to the good pleasure of his will, decided way in advance that he was going to have a plan called Jesus Christ. <laughs> the plan. So that he could bring us back as children, true children, descendants of the Almighty. Now, if you were the descendant of, oh, I don't know, uh, Bill Gates, how would you feel? If you're the descendant of, uh, what's his name, Hilton, how do you feel? If you're the descendant of Rothschild, how do you feel? When people know their heritage, there's something that happens to them. They know that they know that they know. Do you know who I am? Sometimes they get an attitude about it. Do you know who I am? Well, I'm sorry, but we can't let you in. Guido, give me the phone. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we can't let you in. You're not on the ticket. Guido, give me the phone. Here, boss. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Dad, I'm on fifth and spike. And there's this fella here telling me I can't get in. Do we or do we not own this building? Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, would you like to tell him or shall I? <laughs> and you hand the phone over. And all you hear on one end is, yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Click. Here's your phone back. <laughs> Come on in. And you got to think about that for yourself. you got to ask yourself, what's it mean to be a son of God? Please tell me any building God doesn't own. Please tell me any place on planet Earth God doesn't walk. Please tell me anything that God cannot do other than... What? Get you to believe Him? <laughs> if you're a son and a daughter and a handmaiden and you're crying, Abba, Father, you have rights. You have privileges. You have <clears throat> roles and responsibilities. Just thought I'd throw that in for free. <laughs> Romans 8.17 says, And if children, then heirs. Heirs of who? Can you fill in the blank? Heirs of? <laughs> heirs of God. And joint heirs with Christ. Do you ever stop to think about that? You're an heir of God. Ever hear the phrase, um, he's richer than God? <laughs> it's a cliche. He's so filthy rich, he's richer than God. Now let's flip it around for a moment. I have the riches of God. I'm an heir. H-E-I-R. That's not H-A-I-R. I'm not a hair. <laughs> I'm not a hair on God's head. I'm an heir. I'm a joint heir with Christ. Now, you got to see that. We know how important Christ is, right? Mm -hmm. We know how much we need him, love him, serve him, and he's important, right? And it says we're joint heirs. Mm -hmm. Now, shouldn't that just get you thinking for a moment? Mm -hmm. Why does Christ say pray our Father? He didn't say pray your Father. He didn't say pray my Father. He didn't say pray the Father. He said our Father. Elder brother advising rest of brotherly family. Yes, he's the firstborn. Yes, he has the rights. Yes, he holds the keys. Yes, he just handed them to Peter. How can he do that? Simple. They're brothers. <laughs> you hand the keys to family members. You hand the keys over to somebody who's an heir. Hello, heirs. <laughs> Don't put on heirs just because you're heirs. <laughs> but please believe your heirs. Galatians 3.29 And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Ooh, double lineage. I win the jackpot. <laughs> I traded in Adamic lineage, which was, you're sunk, bud, for a double blessing. An Abrahamic blessing? A Christ blessing, a God the Father blessing, a heavenly places blessing. Man, how can I lose? The answer is, I can only lose if I don't believe. I can only lose if I don't believe. 
Galatians 3.26, For ye are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Yes. So there you have, there's six. I mean, there's five. Number six. Oh, and I'm not even halfway through the message. John 15.15, <laughs> Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. If you take that verse and couple it with what I just read in Acts 2.18, And on my servants and on my handmaidens will I pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Pause for a moment in the mind and say to yourself, If servants get prophecies, what do friends get? <laughs> How about nine gifts of the Spirit? How about access to the heavenlies? How about just about whatever you think you need? Say, yeah, but... But God doesn't always answer my prayers. I'm going to offer a challenge. It's a challenge. I challenge myself. How many things do I ask for that I already have? Now let me see something here. There's two ways I can acquire something off my shelf. Right over here. Okay? I can say, would you do me a favor and go get that for me? And you would get up. And you would get that for me, and you would bring it to me. We call that asking. Right? I can reach over and grab the thing for myself. Right? That's me doing it. But what about the place where you don't ask? You command. And you say, get that for me. Isn't that a different attitude than the other two? One is me doing it myself. One is me asking you, and you have the right to reject me. And one is, who's the boss around here? If my boss walks into the room and he says, here's what I need you to do. Pull up on your computer screen. What am I going to say? No, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, that'll go over quick. That'll go over real quick. You see, the truth of the matter is, when you're in a certain place before God, you don't need to ask anymore. You need to declare. You need to say, it's mine. You need to say to the devil, quit stealing. You need to sick the, the heavenly cops on him if he tries. You need to say, this isn't right. You need to say, why are you assaulting me? You have no right. Jesus says, I call you friends. I'm going to tell you the things the Father tells me. I'm going to let it be known to you. And a really strict interpretationist might say, yeah, but that was to the twelve. That ceased at the apostolic age. We don't get that privilege anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Am I in heavenly places? Am I a new creature? Am I a son or daughter? Am I a disciple? Yeah. And what did Christ say to his disciples? Whatsoever I taught you, teach them. Whatever I told you to do, tell them to do. So... If I'm telling you you're my friend, and I'm telling you to tell them, to, then doesn't it pass downstream? And what about that cup of cold water thing? You didn't take care of me when I was. You did take care of me when I was. When, Lord? When, Lord? When you didn't and did to them. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but the apostolic age never stopped. It never ended. It just went sort of into remission for a little while. And then all of a sudden, it woke up again. We are friends. You have to see yourself as a friend. It's okay to see yourself as a servant. It's okay to see yourself as a handmaiden, because that keeps your humility. But if you see yourself as a worm, if you see yourself as a dog, if you see yourself as the puppy at the table and you just only deserve crumbs, then you need an optical adjustment on your spiritual retinae. You need to go, ooh, I'm seeing a little blurry here. I looked in the mirror and I could have sworn I saw something other than a sun. <laughs> I thought I saw an old creature for a moment. There I blinked and nope, I'm still a new creature. I knew that there was a wart on my... No, there wasn't. And as for that robe I'm wearing, you know, spots and wrinkles, we've got so many... What was staring at the spots and wrinkles? Oh, the spots and wrinkles. Oh, the spots and wrinkles. <gasps> what about the white robe? Amen. By definition, a spot and a wrinkle is something on the white robe. Mm -hmm. Ever look at the white robe? 
Or does Christianity always have to spend all of its time with this little magnifying glass going, Do you realize how big that sin is? Do you realize how bad... Did you Have you heard what John did lately? Can I share some spot news for you? Can I go sip for a little while with you? <laughs> you know, coffee clutch, gossip, you know. Oh, you and I need to talk. We got some things to pray about. We got to share a few things here. Uh, tell me, what's a Susie Q been doing lately? I, I just need to know how to cover it in prayer, okay? <laughs> Don't we do that to ourselves? Don't we spend half of our brain time thinking about the spot and the wrinkle? How about dancing before the Lord let the white robe swing a little bit? Want to get your wrinkles out? Go dance. <laughs> let your white robe float in the spirit for a while. I'll bet you he'll iron it for you. Mm -hmm. Spot remover? Not a problem. Big bottle. Blood of Jesus Christ. Instantly removes spots. Thank you very much. Why do we think spots? Here's how we visualize removing our spots. I'll tell you how we do it. We're very works-oriented people. We picture it as I took my garment and I put it over here on the counter and I got myself this really scratchy sponge and I dipped it in a little Holy Ghost and I'm going to rub really hard and I'm going to get this flesh out of here one way or another. I'm going to just, it's going to take me weeks, probably months, probably hours of counseling, probably years of advice, probably, well, I'm going to need about 42 intercessors and 52 prayer warriors, and uh, I better go buy 16 more books on this subject, because they're all spot remover books. They tell me how to remove the spot. Oh, I got a solution. <laughs> and you know what you do when you do that? I'll tell you what you do when you do that. You spread the spot. Oh, that's right. <laughs> And you can't figure out why your sin's getting bigger and bigger the harder you're trying to erase it. Oh, boy. Right. Oh, wow. Wow. See, I have a heavenly perspective. And you didn't know it until this second. In this area, you didn't. I reach over to the bottle. I have two bottles. One, the washing of the water of the Word, which is one solution for one kind of problem. It's a great wrinkle remover. And the other is the blood of Jesus Christ. Robe ready. <laughs> we got this all figured out, don't we? We're just going to work ourselves right into heaven no matter how much grace we preach, aren't we? No, we're not. We're going to learn to stand before God, raise our hands and say, blow. <laughs> and the wrinkles are going to get hit by a blast of hot heat and a little bit of water and just... How's the bride going to make herself ready? Come on, peoples. We're going to throw ourselves in the washing machine, put ourselves through the spin cycle, and hope we come out drip dry and iron it good and tight? <laughs> no, we're not. No, you're not. You're going to do it by changing gravity. The rules up there are not the same as the rules down here. Thank you. Yeah. Instant humidity, wrinkles gone. <laughs> change atmospheric pressure. Ooh, things change. That's the laws of this natural world. Think about it. You change the basic premise of the ecosystem in, you're in and you change. I plunk you on a planet with a nitrogen gas base and you're going to go, gasp, gasp, gasp. I put you in a planet that's got an oxygen base and you go, you know what I mean? Go, get up in the heavenlies and breathe. You're choking me to death. You are, friends. James 2.23, the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, it was imputed unto him for righteousness, he was called the friend of God. I've had people argue with me over this word imputed. <laughs> Who cares what it means? I swapped, okay? <laughs> Did he give it? Did he impute it? Did he impart it? Did he account it? Did he... All right, let's get it down to, let's forget English for a moment. Me, no righteousness. Him, all righteousness. We shook hands. Weird thing happened when we shook hands. Now i am got righteousness. Uh, where'd it come from? I don't know, just got it. How'd it get here? Don't know, just gave it. Well, did he impute it, impart it, transfer it, account it? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Let's for a moment be like the guy who says, I know not about this man. All I know is whereas I was blind, now I'm seeing. Thank you very much. Right. You go analyze the scientific data and figure out how he did it. All I know is he walked up to me, went, and then that's it. Now read my lips. Can I have a simple gospel, please? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
don't get caught up in the paralysis of analysis of vocabulary. Get the point of the picture. I know I'm a visual person speaking to some verbal folks. Okay? So get the picture and make up your own word. <laughs> I'm kidding a little. It's a perfectly good word, imputed. He input. You know what? If I take off the ED, you know what it says? Input. <laughs> if I put an H in front of it, it's input. Works for me. We are now joined with the friend of God. Uh, please go check your Old Testament and tell me, tell, tell me, tell you, tell yourself, how did God deal with Abraham through his life? Then tell me, or tell you, to tell you, how is he dealing with your life? Are you talking to him like a friend? Walk up and talk to him like a friend. You're a friend. You're his friend. What do you do with a friend? You cut it straight, don't you? You walk right up and say, you know, I've been thinking about this, and I just, I'm just not quite sure, and can you explain this to me? And God has no problem with being a friend. Number seven. Am I going to make it to the end of this message? I'm still in the intro. Number, <laughs> number seven. First Corinthians 3.16, 17. First Corinthians 3.16 and 17. Here's something else about you that you need to know about you. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Right on. Okay, let's see. Protected by the Lord. <laughs> yeah. You know... Okay, let's just use a really poor analogy for the moment. Bill Gates has, I don't know, maybe ten cars in his carport. <laughs> Under lock and key, highly protected. What do you think he would do if some lunatic breaks into his garage and decides to write graffiti across the doors and put a little couple of key marks and, you know, just kind of put some lipstick on the windshields of his automobiles? What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> You know, I don't know, but the helicopter coming after whoever did it <laughs> is not going to be cheap. It's not going to be incapable. You know what I'm saying? Today in the news, Bill Gates' car gets vandalized. Big news article, front page. The whole world's going to look for that guy. <laughs> or guys. You know what I'm saying? Go on, hunt him down and kill him. <laughs> Some people will go, yay, the rich man got beaten up. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> now, I just gave you a very, very poor analogy. See, I think a secondary, slightly higher, but also poor analogy is, what about churches that get broken into and their pews get cut up? And evil people go in and they tip over the, the pulpits and they do these things. Doesn't that just get you? Doesn't something inside you go, it's not right, it's not right? You know what that is? That's the Spirit of God in you going, that's not right. You don't touch my people. You don't touch my things. Do you know what God did to people who touched his things? In the Old Testament? You don't touch my ark. You don't touch my candles. You don't touch the fire on my candles. You don't bring strange fire to my candles. You don't walk in my tent when I'm there talking to my friend Moses. You don't do that. Why? Because it's a tent, because it's a tabernacle, because it's an ark, because it's a... It's because it's mine. <laughs> you got to hear yourself in that one. I'm his. I'm his temple. He lives in me. Right. It's kind of hard not to get swell-headed if you think about it too long. And some men of God have thought about it for so long, they have gotten swell-headed about it. But that is almost better than some of the rest of us who are walking around going, I'm really just God's shack. Those are the temple people over there. <laughs> you know that minister who came to town with the anointing? Oh, he's so high up there, I can't even reach him. That's a temple. That's what a real temple looks like. Huh. I'm just the little outhouse on the backside of God's kingdom. The world poops on me. <laughs> Does he get the point across? <laughs> Ever use that line anywhere close? 
The truth of the matter is we oftentimes view ourselves as anything but a temple, <coughs> but an ark, mm -hmm. but the holy place of the Holy One. If you will please accept who you are, you will be a light year ahead of where you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 6.19 What? <laughs> well, the sentence starts, What? <laughs> know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? which you have of God, and you are not your own. You are not your own. You're not your own. What happens when a common vessel becomes used <laughs> for the Lord? It's no longer your own. What happens when Israel decides to hand over the earrings and the jewelry to make those special rings that went into the tabernacle? Because they go back and say, uh, you know, I'm really broke this month. Can I take down one of those curtain rings that I gave you? Can I take back my, my spiritual offering, my natural offering, my... Can I take that back? I need to borrow from it for a moment. <laughs> God goes, I'll take care of you another way. That's my ring. <laughs> you gave it to me. I transformed it from your kind of gold to my kind of gold. Now you don't get to have it. But I tell you what, I'll take care of you a different way. That's why we can't go backwards. Our feet were made to go forward. We're going to go forward. Hallelujah. Blessings up ahead. You're a moving temple. You're a walking temple. You stand in the middle of a room and you're the light. You stand in the middle of worldly people and you're light. You may not know how to open the shutters. You may not know how to get the bushel off your basket. Or is that the basket off your bushel? Whatever. Yeah, yeah. You may not know how to pull open the door and let the light shine. But that does not change the fact that you are the lamp and he is the light and you're in the room. Some ministers start understanding that and oops, people fall down and oops, people do this and oops, people have experiences and oops. And they really look that way, don't they? No, why God do it there? I don't understand. <laughs> uh, available temple plus God dwelling within, access available 24-7. Might I suggest that you open up your temple doors before God periodically? Might I suggest that you stand in front of your adversary, the devil, and open up your windows and let a little light out, <coughs> and then close them and just walk away, you know? Right. <laughs> you know, something wants to have a yap, yap, yap with you in the back of your head, head, head. Just go, <coughs> here, have some light. <coughs> Two verses, three revelations, four visions, and uh, <laughs> whatever else. I guarantee you, they're not going to stick around and listen to you yakking at them. Because they can't stand the light, they can't take the heat, and they've got to get out of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Please, recognize yourself as a temple. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. You speak with tongues. You have the evidence. You have the evidence. Some people say that they're spirit-filled without the evidence. Okay, if you've got such strong faith that you honestly believe God's with you without the evidence, lay it on me. Start doing them miracles. Start raising the dead. Start bringing it to me. That's pretty good faith. Hey, even the lady sitting at the table had such faith that she got the crumbs off the table. She reached up when she wasn't due. Mm -hmm. There's a faith level that can reach further than that. Mm -hmm. But that ain't the promise. That's a strong faith. Get spirit-filled and then have that strong faith. Now what do you do? Oh, what mountain? What fig tree? <laughs> Love the cartoon this morning. Put that mountain back. <laughs> oh, number eight. I better move on. Number eight. Number eight. Eight. Come here, notes later. <laughs> Hebrews twelve twenty two. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Uh, please tell me, are you alone? If you walk on planet Earth alone. Mm -hmm. Do you feel lonely, <laughs> empty, <laughs> hollow inside? Open your eyes, man. you got a crowd following you. <laughs> you got a crowd following you. you got witnesses up there. We have no understanding of how much they get to watch in. Some people say they do. Some people say they don't. Innumerable cloud of witnesses, you know. Well, okay, I'll skip the innumerable cloud of witnesses and bank for innumerable company of angels. Thank you, I can count on that one. Innumerable company of angels? Why? Because I'm in the heavenly Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Oops, I'm royalty. That's right, I'm royalty. I forgot, I'm royalty. 
What? You think the prince of the kingdom, the queens of the kingdom, the kings of the kingdom, the concubines of the kingdom are, are just going to walk through the streets of the kingdom and not have big guys with large swords on either side pushing back the crowd? Hallelujah. Oh, come on. We see it with Hollywood rock stars, and they aren't worth... Well... Well, they're worth... Well, they're rich. <laughs> If this is our example of what kingship looks like in this time period, you know, you know, cavalcade of black cars going down the street, you know, Hummer limos running down the street. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you got to think about it. Who drives those things? Who's in those things? Real ones and wannabes. Real ones and wannabes. Hear me. Real ones and wannabes. Right That's right. The religious or the spiritual. The religious are going to try to drive that, get in that vehicle, have that train, and look important. Mm -hmm. But the spiritual have it. Innumerable company of angels, heavenly Jerusalem, city of the living God. The living God. Oh, I like that. The living God. And he lives in me. The living God. Please, see yourself at all times with escort. It'll take care of any, you know, anxieties. <laughs> Please, see yourself with angels holding back your adversary. So that when you do hear a little yakety yakety yak at the back of the back of the brain, brain, brain. I did that on purpose because it always feels that way when they're talking yak, 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 yak. There you, go. you got two responses possible. You can reach into your holster, which you carry right here on your side, in the spirit. Okay? Sorry, we're modern saints. Okay? The old sword stuff works great for them guys who knew what a sword was. Yeah. I'm going to pull out what's on my side right here, okay? Who's he? <laughs> it's a clock. <laughs> it clocks things. You know what I mean? You've got to think. You're armed. You're dangerous. You're wired. You're connected. You're rich. You're famous. You're powerful. You're in God. You're in heavenly places. You're accompanied by guards. And, and I can't whoop that demon. <laughs> Oh, come on, that's the funniest comedy statement I've ever heard. You know, if you saw it in a black and white 1920s movie, you'd laugh your head off. You know what I mean? 42 foot soldiers, weapons, everything else. And this little guy, this fur ball running around, chasing this guy like he's got importance, like he's powerful, like he's mighty. You know what I mean? I'm sorry, an accidental whoops, I moved him my board and he's off the planet. <laughs> Get your picture straight. Get your picture straight. This is this message. <laughs> Beneath your feet. Yeah. Beneath my feet. Is it hard sometimes? Sure. It's hard. The flesh fights. The soul fights. Everything fights. Is it a fight of faith? Sure. But let's start off by just chalking off every morning. I am, I am, I am, I am. Let's see. Please, stare at that poster for about two hours. Then try to be depressed. Then try to be upset. Then try to be anxious. That poster, you know. Believers saved, saved by grace, this whole poster. If that one doesn't do it for you, go after that one. <laughs> Thou shalt call his name Jesus. He is. There's your picture right there. That's in the mind of your temple right now. It's on your walls, in your brain. All right. Number nine. Hebrews 3, 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Partakers of the heavenly calling... Not only are you who you and where you, <laughs> here's the how you. <laughs> you have a calling. You have a purpose. You have a destiny. You have a future. You have a life. I will admit that the natural world is very much like a briar bush or a, a growing vine that tries to wrap itself around us that we have to put a little weed killer on and make sure we get rid of. Because it'll slow us down. It does slow us down. But if you stop and say, wait a second, I have purpose. 
I, I'm supposed to be doing this. God's given me book titles, or God's given me prayers I'm supposed to pray, or God's given me whatever God's given me. You're never going to be happy till you do it. Because it's part of your heavenly calling. Okay? Your calling is part of you. And God says, what? He does not take his callings back, does right. he? Right. He doesn't revoke things. The only way for you, for, you, uh, for you or I or anybody to lose their calling is through unbelief. The only way you'll not go into the land, conquer the giants, and walk off with the milk, honey, and grapes is if you think they're not grasshoppers. If you think they're giants and you're the grasshopper. When in fact you're the giant and they're the grasshopper. Number 10, starting with Revelation 1.6. He has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. He has made us kings and priests. Revelation 5.10 has made us under our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Can't remember which one if, or, or both of them, but one of them says kingdom of priests. And I think the other one says king and priests in the Greek. Either way, you have to realize... Here's who you are. The next set, few verses is all who you are. You're kings. You're priests. That means you're rulers and intercessors. That means you're intermediaries. You work for the man. <laughs> you're in the middle. It's you and God and anybody else that you're reaching for. <coughs> you're a priest. You're standing in the middle. You can take care of things for people. I think that's why Jesus said, whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, whatsoever you loose on earth is loose in heaven, because we're in the intersection and we're acting as co-mediators. Whereas the Catholic Church wanted to say Ma Mary was the mediator, uh, which we say steals from the glory of Christ, I wonder if the devil's real purpose isn't to say, take away from the body of Christ its mediatorship capability. To get us not to think we could stand before God. That we couldn't go to Christ and put our requests upon him. That we couldn't go before Christ as an elder brother and say, bro, what are we doing today? And do it. So that our heavenly calling gets diluted out to this lie that gets elevated. Christ really didn't lose his power in that lie. They still accept his power in that lie. What we lost was us in that lie. Vision. We lost us. We lost our relationship to the Christ when that lie was created. It's a lie. I'm sorry. Mariology is a lie. Mm -hmm. It takes away from the glory of the real body of Christ. Anything that superimposes itself or puts itself, interposes itself in between the body of Christ and the head is in the way. And God will remove it. But we also have to be willing to say we're part of the head. And the head isn't down here on earthly places. The head isn't operating out of earthly places. The head <coughs> isn't getting commands out of earthly places. It's getting it out of the heavenlies. We are kings and we are priests. We are part of the priestly core. We're part of the kingly training. We're part of the royal family. Get it? Rev, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20 Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. We're representatives. We're the ones who now have to go across lands. We literally have to come out of the heavenlies and go talk to somebody in the earthlies and say, by the way, my name is so-and-so and I'm a representative of the kingdom of heaven, of God of Christ. <laughs> and they're going to go, what? Hi, I'm a representative of the kingdom of heaven, of God of Christ. That's what I thought you said. What does that mean? Well, let me tell you what that means. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sometimes I see the, uh, the pairs that go knocking door to door two different religions that go knocking door to door with pairs, you know. And I say to myself, how hollow is that? What are, what are the real ambassadors supposed to look like? Is door to door the issue? Or is it the door to the door the issue? Let us bring Christ to the door of the heart. Let's make the doors match. Let's see if we can't take plug A and put it in slot B and see if a jolt of spiritual electricity won't pass right through you, the transformer, into that location over there. I ain't talking about new age healy-feely stuff. 
I'm talking about heavenly stuff. <laughs> Ephesians 6.20 says, For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I am an ambassador in bonds. Even if I'm in bonds, even if I'm in a prison, I am an ambassador. Even if I am stuck at local job A doing local task B, I am really deep underneath, beneath my Clark Kent exterior. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you, too, are wearing your outer garment to the world, whatever that outer garment is. But they know, because they've seen you on occasion, all of a sudden, as it were, take your shirt off, move really fast, and go that way. <laughs> and then you came back, and you were just normal you again. But they saw, they heard, they remembered. They knew you were a man or woman of God. They knew that you're an ambassador. They knew. First Peter 4.16 If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You're a Christian. It's okay to use the term now. We're disciples. We are followers. We, are, we follow the Master, and we become like the Christ. We are Christians. Revelation 5.9, they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. We are the redeemed. We're redeemed. You can walk around and go, I'm redeemed. Huh, I was bought back. Huh, I have value. Huh. Hmm? I am one who was not his people. Now, I am his people. Yeah. I, am. I am. I am. Would you like to be his people? You too could be his people. Yeah. Out of every tongue, people, and nation, that means God has no um, holding back. He's not restraining. He's not saying only Israel. He's saying everybody. That is all. Romans 11.5 Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. A remnant. You're a remnant. If you ever want to do an interesting study of the Old Testament, go look up the word remnant. Mm -hmm. You'll find out that remnant is, as it were, when a, 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 an earthquake arrives and everybody's getting wiped out, only the remnant seem to find a way out under God's hand. Mm -hmm. If there's a nation going to come down and, and, and whoop upon God's people because they're not paying attention, it's the remnant who get carted away to safety, sometimes in captivity, while the rest are eliminated. The remnant are the part of the bush that God doesn't trim away. The remnant are the people who God watches over and says, For my remnant's sake, I will spare. For my remnant's sake, I will move. For my remnant's sake, I will answer. You need to see, see that you are a remnant. The devil sees you're a remnant. Revelation 12, 17. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, which have the testimony of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 2, 3-4. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. <laughs> There's that soldier word. Had to put it back in here. Had to remind you. You're a soldier. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We're soldiers. See, once you realize that you come from another place, you live in another time, you serve another master, you're not part of this creation anymore, then you have to realize you're a soldier doesn't mean you got enlisted. It means you're dangerous. Yeah. You're dangerous. The devil looked at you and said, a moment ago that was a slave. Now that's an enemy. <laughs> now that's God. something wearing armor, and it wasn't wearing armor before. It was an emaciated, crushed down, broken-willed person. Oh. I had it. <laughs> Where did that armor materialize from? Dang. Why are their muscles growing? How comes their eyes have light in them? Oh, no! Not again! <laughs> the army of the Lord is going to come off the valley floor. 
The army of the Lord is going to be put together out of a ragtag bunch of people. All of a sudden, out of nowhere. 1 Corinthians 12.27 Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. I'm a member. Ah, we always emphasize the member part. We should emphasize the body part. <laughs> the body part. Us. We. We're part of a we. You're not fighting this alone. You're not in this life alone. You're not doing this alone. You're not seated in heavenly places alone. Everything was e, we, us. We, us. We, us. We, us. Oh, we, us. Ye are the body of Christ. <coughs> Ye are the body of Christ. <coughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> For those on the tape, the wow is because... Well, we did this much. Cool. And we have this much. I'm going to be gentle and kind today. Gentle and kind. I'm going to summarize for a moment and leave the rest of this message be, and we'll see how and where it fits in as part two or what. Because it is part two of this. Here's a picture. Here's the picture. When you stop and you say to yourself, I'm here. My hand's way up here, okay? And everything else is down here. There's two things that happen. Number one, a sense of elation. When you finally get it, whether it's for a minute or five minutes or 20 minutes, an hour, a week, everything else you feel is down here. Because you're up here now. Your heart, your mind, your spirit recognizes that other existence and it's real. And everything else goes like flat pop. That's the phrase I use this week. Flat pop. Flat pop. Does not taste good. Once you've tasted of pure water, muddy water has a flavor to it. Uh -huh. It's a fact. You know? You taste um, bad wine. <laughs> you taste sour stuff. Then you go taste something that's sweet. You know the difference. You know the difference. When you're in a place where you're not thinking with your spiritual mind, you're not looking at life as a spiritual man, judging all things spiritually, comparing things which are spiritual with things that are spiritual, and living and walking and breathing spirit, you feel, act, behave, think a different way. In a certain sense, the message I preached last week, called The Stranger, is about double-mindedness. Because we human beings have this amazing capacity to fracture. We fracture. We get confused. The good that I would do, I do not. The good that I don't want to do, I do. I mean, the good, bad that I don't want to do, I do. Fractured. We waffle between ourselves back and forth, talking with, <coughs> talking with having a discussion with the stranger. When we get to the place where we are, um, what, did Jesus, what was Jesus' term? A single eye. When we get to the place where the light that be in us be light, how great is that light? That's far more powerful a statement than the warning he gave them. How great is that light? Number two, when you're in that place, you see clearly. You see distance. You see with clarity. You know, when you're walking around in a London fog and you're trying to find a lamppost in a street corner and you're afraid you're going to step, you're driving through Oregon fog on the street and you can't tell where the road is, the mountain is, the side of the hill is, and the vehicle in front of you, it's scary, it's fearful, it's nerve-wracking, you get wore out. But when you're in the clarity of the Spirit, it's like, oh, 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 there it is, oh, I see that, that's clear, yeah. no problem. Somebody else goes, what are you talking about? I can't see that. Well, you know that fog that's over your head, like, like the picture of Pigpen out of Charlie Brown, you know, with that dust cloud? 
only in this case it's a fog cloud over your head, just following you around, you know, just keeping you spiritually in the fog, spiritually in the dark, spiritually in the, you know what I'm saying? See? Brother right next to you said, can't you see, brother, the Lord standing right there? And we're like Balaam having a conversation with the donkey. What, Lord? What are you talking about? I don't see him. <laughs> when you're in heavenly places, it's gone. It's gone. Blows it away. Atmospheric pressure changes. Fog goes away. <laughs> Number three, when you're in that place and you're in the zone, as I sometimes call it, when you're in the spirit, as the Pentecostals call it, when you're there, all of a sudden, you find yourself believing for all kinds of things you couldn't believe for before. You believe. You believe. I mean, you know that you know that you know that you know. Two days later, after you're out of the spirit and you're walking around and you're getting covered again by the whirly muck, your soul goes, do, do, do I really know that? And maybe I should just do some more Bible researches on it. Um, I'm not so sure. And then you get into the Spirit, you spend a little time in worship, and then you put on a song, and that song puts you there, and God picks you up, and He cuddles you, and He holds you, and it gets clear again, and all of a sudden you go, pfft, oh, pfft. what was I thinking three days ago? I mean, that was insanity. That's nuts. I mean, of course, I mean, <laughs> it's obvious, isn't it? See, that's the struggle we go through. That's the real struggle. We need more time out of the fog than we are in the fog. Amen. And one of the ways you get there is by getting in the elevator. Take these truths and get in the elevator. What am I doing down here? How did I ever fall out of the 42nd story of the spiritual God building and land down here? <laughs> Somebody push me? Did I fall asleep while sitting on the ledge? <laughs> get back up. Get in the elevator. Get up. Climb. Rise. Accept. I mean, baby Christians, they come in, you know, and I'm a new creature. I'm a new creature. Can I pray for you, brother? Older saints come in and go, I'm an old creature, I'm an old creature, can I pray for your brother? <laughs> come on. And we say, well, the young ones get better results because they haven't learned yet. <laughs> no, maybe they did learn. <laughs> maybe they learned it all too well. Mine. Every little kid knows that one. Mine. My God. My Christ. My gift. My power. It's not your power, it's God's power. Kid, quit bragging. Ooh. No, it's my power. My gift. <laughs> childlike my. Not adult-like, egotistical my. Childlike my. Number four. When you're in that place, when you're in that zone, when you're in that spirit, you're going to find God wanting to share. And you are going to have to be willing to sit still, shut up, and enjoy the ride. Because he's got places to go, people to see, and things to do. Now when, as it were, the spiritual chariot pulls up next to your house, and as it were, the guard knocks on your door and says, <clears throat> uh, he'd like to talk to you for a minute. <laughs> now we've all seen the movies where the black limo pulls up, and they say, <clears throat> uh, we'd like to talk to you for a minute. Or the one where the military limo walks up, pulls up and, <clears throat> Sir, we need you to come to the Pentagon. No! I'm watching my favorite TV show right now, thank you very much. <clears throat> sir, President said you're coming right now. But I'm in my pajamas! That's okay, sir, we have your uniform at the door. <laughs> Fact. Happens that way all the time, all over the planet. Fact. Fact. Rich people and powerful people don't think like poor people and unpowerful people. Yeah, when you start making yourself available to God, chariots might show up. Angels might visit. Tasks might need to be done. Bring it on. <laughs> you in it. <laughs> the presence of the Lord shows up on you, and maybe he just abides for a little while. You know what I had to say to somebody last night? They were describing to me, you know, I'm, I get in my car, and I start worshiping the Lord, and this presence, you use the word presence, this feeling comes down over me. I said, I have a suggestion for you. Next time it comes over you, just go, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for being here. Thanks for showing you care about my life. See what happens next. <laughs> I can't wait to see what that report's going to look like. Because <laughs> that's what it's all about. I mean, you were doing what you were doing up until the chariot arrived, up until the limo pulled up, up until the guard knocked on the door of your heart and said, here I am. Is it scary? I find it a little scary. Sure. 
you know, I mean, I just, you're going to get your life a little bit turned around, you know? I'd be, I'd be freaking if all of a sudden the doorbell rang right now. I go up to the doorbell, uh, up to the door, you know, and I open up the door, and there's an angel standing with a golden sword, a couple of wings, and God knows what else shining out of his face. He goes, uh, by the way, uh, uh, Master would like to talk to you for a minute. Well, I'm right in the middle of preaching a sermon. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I mean? So you know what God does because he knows we have a little bit of problem with that get in the limo, son thing? He just goes, slain. <laughs> knock, knock, boom. <laughs> well, I don't understand. I don't see that in the Bible. Why does God have to knock people down on the floor? Well, because they won't get in the limo. They won't hop in the chariot. They won't take the elevator going up. So he says, okay, we're going to do the old cancel time and space continuum thing. Boom. Now, now that you're laying there, I'm laying here. I'm not sure why I'm laying here. Is there a reason I'm laying here? <laughs> Maybe God was giving you a time out. <laughs> You've been doing too much carnal <laughs> thinking. Maybe he's getting ready to send a transmission. You better shut up. That's right. Or maybe he's just humbling you so that you get the point he's bigger than you. <laughs> You know, like that gigantic, big, great Dane that runs through the house, sees his friend, and goes, Whoa! <coughs> and you're down on the ground with this lickety, lickety, lickety all over you. You know, ever had a great Dane? I had. Working at the vet's hospital, a great Dane got out of his cage, met me at the back door. He stood up on his hind legs and put him right here on either shoulder, and I stared the dog square in the face. I mean, it took every ounce of willpower not to fall on the ground because he was heavy. <laughs> So God is at least like that. Oh, hi, it's good to see you. Thunk. And sometimes you end up on the ground. You're sitting before the Lord going, why am I here? I knew a brother one time who went in to talk to the Lord. And uh, this is his testimony, not mine. He walked in to talk to the Lord. And it didn't seem like a great prayer time. And he was just talking to the Lord. It was an okay prayer time. And uh, he decided, well, I guess I better go, get up and go to class. And he went to get up and his body wouldn't move. Yeah. It was plastered to the floor. Mm -hmm. You know, God Velcro. <laughs> he said, uh, he tried several times. He said, I'm a very strong individual. I can do certain things. I couldn't get off the floor, no matter what I tried. So I logically concluded God wasn't done with me yet. Mm -hmm. Guess I'll be missing class. Mm -hmm. He said he was there for exactly the length of class. When the bell rang, he was released. Well, that's interesting. God obviously had some uh, <clears throat> stitching this and fixing that and adjusting this. and it, You know what I mean? See, when you're in that place, number five, when you're in that place, Anything's possible, everything's possible, nothing's impossible. So we just have to start thinking that way. Everything's possible, nothing's impossible. Readiness, willingness, o openness, surrender, that's our response. But the truth of the matter is, it shouldn't be that hard. It shouldn't be that hard. How hard is it to get happy when the Spirit of God comes on you? You know? Likewise, how hard should it be to get anointed if this, if for healing or deliverance or whatever, you know? Uh, praying for somebody, you know? Do we drum up business? Do we have to drum it up out of our spirit? Come on, Spirit. <laughs> no, we just have to say, Here I am, Lord. Here I am. What do you want from me? What do you need from me? All we have to do is shake sleep. All we have to do is wake up. All we have to do is watch, like the disciples were told, watch, watch, pay attention, stay alert. I think probably one of the, heart, uh, the heartbeats of this message is visual, but you may have to verbalize, verbal yourself into it. It's visual. If you could just picture yourself sitting on the throne as a joint heir with Christ, right next to God, looking at planet Earth, lots of things to pray about, let God spin that globe in front of you, shine a little light here, a little light there, a little light there, and say, pray for that area, pray for that, pray for that, pray for that. Mm -hmm. Have his special God satellite scope scoop down, you know, get it down from the continent, down to the city, from the city, down to the street, from the street, down to the house, down from the house, down to the kid in the house, down to the... Amen. You know what I'm saying? Amen. I don't know who he is. I've heard preachers do this, and it bothers me, but it it, it just... It bothers everybody because it's so <laughs> nebulous, right? You know, I don't know who it is, but th there's a woman with a goiter on the bottom side of the left ear lobe right behind the hairline that was cut by a bad surgery for a... Yeah. And I don't know who you are, where you are, but you're out there. 
And I feel like saying that's about the most unprecise prayer I've ever heard. And, and, and I can make that up, you know. Well, let's see. Uh, there's a man. He's got eyes with a nose and an ear. You know, the skeptics of the movement, that's exactly what they say. You know, how do you know? Well, I don't know, but <laughs> this lady writes and says, I was that lady, I was that lady, and it went away. Well, here's what's really weird. They all admit that sometimes they get more than one letter. <laughs> so what happened? The critics would say, see, it was just so nebulous, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but one of them was really the one he wanted, and the rest just were all believing in faith. God knew which one he was going after. Yes. Preacher knew which one he was talking about, you know, in general. But quite frankly, if a woman's going to run through the crowd and slap her hand on Jesus' cloak while it's going by, for the same ailment, even if it's off in description just a little bit, it really wasn't under her left earlobe, it was behind her left earlobe, you know, but she didn't catch that underword part, but it's there. What's the mathematical probability is that each of us have one eye that's not quite right? <laughs> What's the probability that God can heal 12 people by making one statement to some preacher who's going to stand up and say, As Son of God, I hereby declare you're healed! Yeah. Poof! Out goes the Spirit of God running all over the planet. Anybody available? Anybody available? Where's the right-eyed people who need healing? For just that microsecond? Is it possible that he's just kind of like spreading the load a little bit? Spreading the blessing? Spreading out? Well, I don't know. I'd like to have it be more precise. Your name is Susie. You live on 4th and Pike. You've got a goiter under your left eyeball. and <laughs> You know, yeah, that would pin it down real good. Okay, so God's going to do it the way God's going to do it, and he's probably going to ramp it up here down the road, but right now we're believing for this stuff that's a little bit broader. But you know what it's really doing? It's convincing the man of God who said all that I'm seated in heavenly place, and God told me to say this, and I haven't a clue why, and I'm going to say it, and we're going to see what the result is. Because the only other option is to not to believe, and that's not an option. Good so you critics, go ahead and criticize me. I think it's the Spirit of God, and if I think it's the Spirit of God, I better act on it. If I know it's the Spirit of God, I certainly better act on it. Right? Mm -hmm. So when you're in the Spirit, you know that you know that you know, but you don't know why you know sometimes. But you know. The Spirit of God takes the Word, the soil, as it were, and then He takes His Spirit and He mingles it with the Word. Then He applies it to your eyes and says, Blind see. Now go wash your eyes off. And you now see. Did you really think your, your ministry is going to be any different? Did you really think you're going to do it a more unique way? Did you really think you were going to drum up business for yourself and get in the Spirit the hard way? No. See, these things are by belief. These things are by persuasion. These things are by acceptance. These things are by confession. These things are by declaration. These things are by command. These things are by 100% unadulterated, pure, raw faith. I think half of our unbelief is about who God is, and the other half of our unbelief is about who we are. And if we disbelieve about who we are, we're disbelieving who he said we are, and thereby we're disbelieving him. So, God is, and he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Amen. Fact. 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 This Bible is not full of fiction. This book is loaded with fact. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Trust the Lord to take you to heavenly places. I'm asking God for my sake and yours to ramp it up more. I'm asking God to lift us higher. I feel like this message was given to me last night as a, as a if I could say it this way, pastor just put his foot, and then I don't drive one of these, so I'm not very good at this, but you could tell me if I'm right, put his foot on this little kickstand thing that goes <laughs> on the motorcycle, and, you, and he's supposed to push on it really hard, you know, and it's supposed to start something here. So, okay, I've given you the message, and I'm kicking, Let's see if you can get this motorcycle to drive. You know what I mean? Whatever that thing's called, the kick thing. Kickstarter, yeah. Okay? You're, I, I'm trying to tell you, get up there. Get the engine running. Get it going. This is what God's after. This is where we're going. We, 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 we don't have time to analyze why it hasn't been working. We don't have time to look at why it isn't. We don't have time to wonder why, how come. we got to know what, where, when, who, and why. Future tense. 
God will show us the other parts we've been doing wrong and get us on, up on board and help us patch up, fix up, or whatever it is we got to do in flight. But the truth of the matter is we're in flight. Ain't no stopping us now. No stopping us but us. No quitting but us. I don't know how much time we've got. I could be alive a week, a month, a year. If I die, who takes over? You know what I'm saying? We have to keep moving. The baton has to keep going. The men of God before us died. They're gone. I go to the bookshelf. I rent their books. Oh, they buy their books. <laughs> I rent them. <laughs> I wish I rented them sometimes. And you know what I find? For every generation, they said the same things. Amazing, cohesive testimony of the men of God going over the same verses, getting the same point, climbing up to the same altitude, <laughs> and coming down on us like <laughs> you know, diamonds out of a bag. Jesus, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for this message. We thank you for telling us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And especially, Lord, for telling it to us because being spirit-filled people, Lord, we know that spiritual things are available to us. And there are many, Lord, who would speak it and say it, but they're never going to reach up and grab for it. We ask you, Lord, to help us to reach up and grab for it. We want to pluck the fruit right off the spiritual tree. We want to partake. We want to grow. and We want to grow now. We ask Jesus that you would finish the work on the inside of us and then show it on the outside of us. But do it, Lord. Do it. Help us to cope with it, but do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, thank you.